Who I'm excited to share with you today. I want to make life so simple for us. It really is. It just comes down to reflecting the glory of God. How many of you would like to end this life knowing that you just were a bright light for the love and the glory of God? Come on, let me hear from you if you'd really like that. Oh, the question is, how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, if we, if we try to do it, this isn't something we really just say, all right, I'm going to reflect the glory of God if it kills me. And yes, it will kill you if you approach it that way. Uh, it, is, it is something that Jesus called a light yoke. It is not this heavy burden that we place on ourselves. We simply live as mirrors, reflecting God in every situation, in every circumstance. And today, I want to share with you uh, a message. Some of our uh, youth leaders went to a conference and the pastor shared some of this message. And it's such a cool way to look at scripture. And it so fits our series. I wanted to share some of that with you as well. But let me describe life to you this way. This is how I often will break life down. There is your being. Uh, there, your being describes who you are. And then there is your doing. So this side of the room, just holler out being. One, two, three. Being. being. This side of the room, just holler out doing. One, two, three. Doing. doing. All right. Your, there's your being, being, look around, all of you represent a characteristic of your being. Now, this includes your character, your integrity, your faith, your obedience, your personality, your giftedness. This is who you are. This is your what? Being, being pretty good. Now, your doing... This represents your actions, what you actually do in this world, what job you take on, who you marry, what kind of ministry you get involved in, all, how many times you go to church. These are your actions or your what? Doing. Now, which one matters more to God? Well, of course, they, they both matter, but I want to, uh, I want to share with you and, and please urge with you to adopt this mindset that your being means so much more to God than your doing. But which one do we ourselves get wrapped up in? Doing. doing. It's always, whenever I ask somebody, what are the questions that you're wrestling with in life? They are almost without fail doing questions. It's always I just don't know, uh, you know, if I'm supposed to leave this job or get a next one. I just don't know who I'm supposed to be with. I just don't know where I'm supposed to live. What am I supposed to major in? What, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Those are, those are always our questions. And God's saying, I'm not even over here. That's not what I'm focused on. I am here. I am looking at your being. Because listen, God, Scripture describes God as a potter. And we are simply the clay in His hands. And so what, life, the process of life, let me go ahead and share with you a verse that I shared last week out of 2 Corinthians. I think it's 2 Corinthians 3. Can we put that on the screen for everybody? Yeah, it says, all of us reflect the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces. And notice, this is our purpose, to reflect as a mirror the glory of the Lord, no more hiding it as Moses had to do at times, totally unveiled, totally uncensored. We just reflect the glory of God. We are becoming more like Him with ever, I love this, with ever increasing glory. Say that with me. Ever increasing glory by the Lord's Spirit, which, which means He's not done with you yet. Thank God He's not done. How many of you are glad He's not done with you yet? Hey, if I were to tell you, if I were to tell you your best years are still to come, how many of you would like to receive that word this morning? My, my best is still ahead. Well, that is the promise I give to you from God's word because he doesn't say, all right, I'm going to give you the best and then see what you do with it. Try not to break it, all right? I'm going to give you my glory. Try not to screw it up the rest of your life. No, as Jesus did in his first miracle, turning water into wine, he waited till the very end to bring out the best wine, all right? So for us in our lives, he's going to wait till the very end to really reveal his most glory in us. And the way that process works is most of our life is about forming and shaping our heart, 
our character, our integrity, our obedience, our personality, how we respond to situations. Most of our life, listen doing people, most of our life is about our being. It's who we are becoming. Then, as Scripture says, once we are mature and complete, lacking in nothing in the book of James, then the pattern is that God tends to shift us into a place to do powerful things. To use the soldier analogy, you can carry around a sword and a pistol and do a whole lot of push-ups. That does not make you a soldier. You can do all the things a Christian does. You can go to church, you can read your Bible, you can get on team life, you can join a small group, you can memorize scripture. Does not say a word about your heart, about your being. Those are all external realities, external habits. Those are your doing. And we get in a whole lot of trouble and we head down a really frustrating path when we start with the doing to get to the being. Does that make sense? Just holler at me if it makes sense. I, 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 feedback helps me. All right. If, if, you, if you start with the do and say, all right, I want to be a great Christian. I want to please God and reflect His glory. You don't start with the doing. And that's the mistake. Well, you don't, all right, I just, I've got to read my Bible. I've got to pray 500 times a day. Now, no, you start with God. Here's my life and my heart. Be the potter. I'm just going to be clay. And then the softer your, your, your heart is in his hands, the faster he can mold you into his image. And so when you give him your heart and he says, this is the place I want to reshape first. You know, you've kind of got a, a hard heart in this area and this is how I want to change you. And then you let him change you. However, if you're focused on the being, here's what happened. And listen to me, this is the story of my life. If you're focused on the being and God says, you know what, I want to reshape this. Hold on, God. Can't you see what all I'm doing for you? I think I'm good just the way I am. I entered ministry at a very young age, about 17 years old. And here's what I've learned. Our, our gifts emerge quickly. Our maturity takes a while. So I entered ministry at a young age and I had certain gifts that made me valuable to ministries and so I got promoted very rapidly, way far, far beyond my maturity level. And guess what? I absolutely crashed and burned and took down a lot of lives with me. Because I was so focused on the, be, on the doing because, man, I mean, people were getting saved. Ministry was growing. I was successful in the eyes of all my peers. I had it going on, traveling the country doing ministry. However, while that was looking good on the outside of the glass, as Jesus would say, the inside of the glass was getting dirtier and dirtier. And you start to slip a little bit in sin, and it's like, you know... Yeah, I know that's not cool, but look at what's going on. I mean, things are happening, so maybe this isn't such a big deal. And so you keep doing a lot, and your being slips. And this is my story. And so it got to the point to where the outside of the cup looked clean to people. The inside of the club, cup was contaminated and full of grime. And if you find yourself in that place, I can, I can testify to this, you'll be a miserable soul. You'll, you'll hate yourself because you'll be doing all these things that look good, but on the inside you know there's nothing but decay. And for me, I got to the place where I said, God, I, I hate my life. I said, God, I know this is not pleasing to you. God, I know uh, that... I don't want to reach the end of this life and this be what I have to show for it. For me, I said, God, take it all away. If, if I have to lose every bit of the doing, I want to be who you called me to be. I don't care about the reputation of men. I, all I care about is what you think of me and what you see in me. I, and my prayer specifically was, God, take it all away. Get me to the place where the only thing that matters is you. And for me, that's what it took. I lost everything. Kicked out of ministry, kicked out of school, lost my health, uh, went bankrupt, homeless, 
no chance of a future whatsoever broke me down. Now, I would love to be able to say just like that. I said, all right, God, I get it. Things are great now. No, it was hell for about three years and borderline suicidal just thinking I have screwed up the rest of my life. There's nothing left for me. And yet, as I said last week, Jesus said when His glory comes through, one of two things are going to happen. Some things are going to get crushed or they're going to get broken. But either way, we're going to be left in a humble pile of ourselves, saying, God, everything that was not of Him was crushed. And all that was left was just a little bit of humility, saying, God, I'm broken before you. I've lost the respect of everybody in my life. All that matters is you. And little by little by little, months and years of restoration that I'm still walking in, God is continually reshaping my heart or my being. God says, I don't, I'm not impressed by anything you do. God's not impressed by a, a single act of our life. I mean, think about it. What are we going to throw up to God where he goes, hmm, impressive, pretty good. Hey, like, we can't impress God. Our salvation is not by work, so none of us can boast. Nothing we have that we do, none of the works of our hands mean anything. Even our righteousness, Scripture says, is as filthy rags compared to God. Nothing we do amounts to anything. God is right here. For most of our life, God is right here saying, I, I, I'll worry about the doing later. I'm the author and finisher of your faith. I will position you to do what I want you to do. You don't worry about that. I want you to simply be clay in my hands. Allow me to reshape your heart, your mind, your integrity. All your faith, I want your being. I want your being. I want who you are. Then, then and only then. And the cool thing is if you read Scripture, in every single incident, those who finished well, those who reflected glory the brightest, their most powerful years on earth were their last few. In other words, God completed this work of being, and then He said, all right, now you're ready. Now you can be trusted with my glory, and now you're ready to reflect it because real ministry flows out of authenticity. Does that make sense? And Let me hear it from you. You got that? Real ministry flows out of authenticity. It, you can do ministry with a wicked heart. It's possible. I've done it. You can do ministry with a wicked heart and it counts for nothing. You can be broken and be doing nothing. You can do nothing with a heart that is broken before God. And he says, I love that. Got you in my hands. So the idea, what God wants to do in us is to take our lifetime and everything that we do is about who we are becoming. So from now on, as you wrestle with life and wrestle with your, your personal questions and what's next, don't ask yourself, what am I supposed to do? Don't you even have to pray, God, what am I supposed to do? Let your prayer always be, God, what are you doing in me through this? Who am I becoming through this? What are you making me? How are you shaping me? And for good situations, God... What have you taught me through this? In bad situations, God, I don't like it or understand it, but how are you using this to reshape me? Let your questions become being questions. Let your prayers become being prayers. Make sense, everybody? All right, now, when we reflect the gl glory of God, I, what does that look like? And I just want to throw out something really cool at you today because I want to give you some real practical examples of what it looks like when we began to reflect God's glory. I had a... Uh, in my college years, I, I had a great relationship with a campus pastor who I just loved. He was such a man of integrity and humility and just such a wise Bible teacher. I got to reconnect with him recently. I hope to introduce all of you to him. But I, I just learned so much from him. And he began to point out things in Scripture to me which I thought were just the coolest, coolest beyond cool. 
And it, it, was, it was things that just ma made my hunger for the Word of God come alive. Let me, let me just give you an example. I don't, I don't know if this will speak to you. It's just a cool, a cool thing to know about Scripture. Did you know that the four Gospels actually utilize a literary technique called inclusio? Uh, which basically means the beginning and the end of each Gospel is the same and it summarizes the theme of that Gospel. What Matthew is about is God coming to earth in the form of Jesus and promising that he will never leave us or forsake us. Uh, the next gospel, Mark, look how it does it. It begins with, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it ends with the centurion watching Jesus on the cross saying, surely this was the Son of God. And Mark is all about the identity of Christ as God's Son and who He is in our lives. That's just a cool thing to me. Let me share with you the other two. Uh, in Luke, uh, the theme of Luke is that Jesus is fulfilling all that was said about Him. And so the very first verse says, this is an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. His life, death, and resurrection was all prophesied centuries in advance, and it ends with Jesus saying to him, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything will be fulfilled that is written about me. I was like, wow, this is just, this is cooler and cool it's just coming alive and then finally in in john it's it, this is about all who believe in the in, in the son of god will be saved it starts out with those who believe in his name he gave the right to become children of god and at the very end these things are written that you may believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and by believing in him you may have life in his name it says hey, all the works and miracles that jesus did was for one purpose so that you might believe and trust in him and belong to the family of god that's just that's just cool it just makes me want to dig into those gospels well i want to share with you another way to look at the gospels that i think are just equally as cool let me take you to a couple of passages uh, unless you grew up in church, these may not be familiar to you. It's a couple of prophetic verses, one in the book of Revelation and one in the book of Ezekiel, and they're very similar. In Revelation chapter 4, now this was written by one of Jesus' disciples, John. He was on an island called Patmos, and God gave him a vision, a revelation of his glory, what it looks like. And he just saw the glory of God, and it says, in the center around the throne were four living creatures. Now, actually, this is one creature with four identities. And they were covered with eyes in front and back. The first was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third like a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. Pretty cool, huh? Doesn't really speak to me. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's pretty cool. It says that he saw the glory of God and it looked like those four creatures. But if you look back in Ezekiel, the first chapter of Ezekiel, he also received a vision of God. And look what he says. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, a lion on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox and an eagle. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Pretty cool. So here we have in Revelation an image of the glory of God. It's an ox, an eagle, a man, and a lion. And then previously in Ezekiel, you have the same picture. The, glory, the likeness of the glory of God looks like these four things. Well, well, scholars and theologians have connected these four creatures again to the four Gospels, and they also show Jesus in this light. And so for us, here's how it applies to us. When we want to reflect the glory of God, we're going to look like either the ox, the man, the eagle, or the lion. You may not have prayed this way before, but I hope from now on, as you pray, every day you'll say, God, make me like an ox. And this pastor said, it's all right, ladies, you can pray for a skinny ox. It's cool. <laughs> make me like an ox. Make me like a man. Make me like an eagle. Make me like a lion. Well, that, what does that mean? Look in the book of uh, Mark is, ten, is tended to give credit by showing Jesus as the ox or the face of the servant. The ox was the beast of burden used to plow the land. And Jesus is seen as the one. Jesus said, you want to be great? You serve the least. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And this is the question to ask yourself. How much of your life is spent for your glory, for making a name for yourself and being served? And how much of your life is truly rolling up your sleeves and serving others? 
In Luke, you see Jesus time and time again going to the people who were sick and diseased and smelly and disgusting and rolling his sleeves up or wrapping his arms around them. It says he just looked over the crowd and just had compassion. Just had compassion over them. And he just, he got his hands dirty. He served those who were lowly. Now here is the Son of God who came to earth and if anyone had the right to live for his own glory, it was Jesus. He says, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Now let's ask ourselves this. Do we live as the ox? Do we reflect the glory of God living as the ox, serving those around us? Or is it about others pleasing us? Let's stop and pray right now. Father God, make us like the ox. Father, I just want to see a church full of people who just stumble over themselves trying to be the first to serve. Father, give us humility. Give us humble hearts. Let us look around and see others above ourselves. Give us the heart of Jesus, the heart of a servant, to take care of each other, even if it costs us our own pleasure and comfort. Amen. Next up, we have the, heart, the face of the man. And many people give credit to Luke for showing Jesus as the man. Uh, this is the face of relationships. And all throughout the book of Luke, you see Jesus telling stories about what it means to relate to him, stories about the kingdom of God being very personable. And that Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, first, we give glory to God. First, we love God. And then we love each other. We love our neighbors as ourselves. We love our enemies. We love and take it. The face of the man is the face of compassion. It's the face of relationships where we truly have a heart that's bent toward each other. Uh, it's kind of cool. In the four Gospels, you track Jesus' genealogy in different ways. In, uh, for instance, the book of Matthew, it's traced all the way back to Abraham. Uh, in uh, the book of, uh, let's see, uh, Luke, uh, is that the one we're in now? I'm getting, I'm getting all the animals and names and illustrate. Yeah, uh, Luke, the, the, the man is traced back to Adam. In other words, what the writer was doing was saying, look, not only is Jesus the Son of God, he's also one of us. He is born of Adam. Another interesting thing, in Mark, in the Ox chapter, that's the only gospel where there's no genealogy mentioned at all. And some people think, well, Jesus is shown as the servant and no one cares about the pedigree of a servant. And so then you get to John where it's really cool. It's traced all the way back to the beginning where it says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and then the Word became flesh. It's Jesus. So it's really cool to see how the different Gospels approach who Jesus is and describe Him. So here we have the face of a man. And so the question I have for you, has your heart become cold, calloused? Are you a person of compassion? Do you live each day? Do you mourn with those who mourn? Are you burdened by each other's burdens? Scripture says to carry each other's burdens, to encourage one another, to lift each other up. And Jesus, he didn't have to, but thank God, he mourns with us when we mourn. He cares for our needs. He cries with us. He holds us. And he says to reflect the glory of God, you've got to be a people of compassion. You can't be hard and callous. And man, this is probably for us more. I, I talked to several men after the first service, like, all right, I got to work on being a real man if that's what a man is. Because I'm hard and I'm, I'm, I'm tough. Well, Jesus, let me tell you, you know what Jesus' occupation was? Jesus was a carpenter. Now, this ain't no uh, skill saw on some two-by-four. Right? That's, that's not a carpenter in Jesus' day. They didn't have electric tools, and they weren't working with wood. They were working with stone. And they made incredible uh, pieces of work with stone. So, yes, in case you want, Jesus was, was ripped. He was a man. He was tough. And yet, he was a, he was a man of compassion. And so men especially, we should walk with tenderness, with kindness, with gentleness. That is the fruit of the Spirit of God working in our lives.
And God may say, I want to change that about you today. Now let's go to the third animal, the face of the eagle. Many people see uh, Jesus as the eagle in the book of Matthew. This is the face of excellence. This is beauty and majesty and just awe. Have, have any of you ever seen up close an eagle flying? I mean, well, just, just check this out. Have any of you ever seen really uh, an American eagle in flight? It is just one of the coolest things. You can't help but to watch this and just be in awe of its beauty. Somebody told me, I mean, check this out. That is bad to the bone. Fish ain't got a chance. Here, here it comes. Get ready for this. Boom. Salmon gone. I mean, just the precision, the excellence, the beauty. Don't you just watch that? It's like, wow. I mean, that's just, that's just cool. Too cool for school. School's out. I mean, it's, I mean, you just, if you see an eagle, it's just, it's, it's incredible. It's just, it's just mind-blowing. And that's, that's what God wants us to look like. Like, when people see us, they should be like, wow. Wow, that person's, that person's different. When, they come to, when people come to church, they should leave going, whoa, what, what was that? What did I just experience? That was different. That was life. That was, whoo, wow. I mean, when people see you, now, the, the, the eagle represents excellence. And maybe in our culture, this is the area where we struggle. Maybe this is the area we fall short. Because we should be a people of excellence in every way. I mean, Scripture says whether we eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. So in the way we deal with people, are we excellent? Is, is our, does our yes mean yes, or do we try to manipulate people in situations? Can we be trusted with our word? How do we handle our finances? Do we, do we handle it with integrity, above reproach? Are we people of character? Are we people of just precision and excellence? I so want us to be excellent in all that we do. I want our worship services to be excellent. That gives, I believe excellence pleases God, gives glory to God, and is attractive to people. I want our groups to be excellent. I want everything we do to be excellent. Doesn't mean we're there in every way, but we're working on it. Why? For our own glory? No, because Jesus is excellent. And he is a man of integrity and character and discipline. And we of a people tend to slip into laziness, to being sluggards, looking for shortcuts looking for ways to take breaks when we should be working. Let me tell you, if you go to work this week and do way above and beyond what is asked of you, your supervisors are going to look at you weird. Like, what is going on? And that's how people should look at you. Because if you live excellently, doing more than is asked of you, doing it with precision, doing it with all your heart, People will stop and notice and say, wait a minute, something's different about this person. That's what happened to Daniel. In Daniel, it's chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Daniel so distinguished himself. Other scriptures say he distinguished himself with excellence. He distinguished himself among the administrators by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, I think, I really believe this. If we lived with the excellence that God has called us to, many, many, many more of us would be getting promotion after promotion after promotion. Now, I'm not going to preach prosperity, but I would say before you complain about your current job level, ask yourself, am I living with excellence? Am I doing more than is asked of me? Am I showing up early? Am I staying a little bit later? Do I work until the job is done and do it with all that I've got? Do I sign my name to everything that I do? Am I a person of integrity? Can I be trusted? Am I disciplined? Or do I look for the easy way out? Ask yourself today. 
Because to reflect the glory of God, Scripture is telling us, be people of excellence. And finally, this is a, a cool, and this is the one that, makes, that ties them all together. The final face is the face of the lion. And this is the face of power. Of just the king of the jungle. The king of all animals. This is power. And yes, Jesus was a man of great power. What it says about him in Acts is this. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And say it with me. Power. And he went around doing good in healing all who were under the power of the devil. Because God was with him. This right here could change the game for us if we become a people of power. If we leave here and we hit our community with hands that have power in them, oh my goodness. If we speak prayers of power that availeth much, watch out. And I think that's why we, sort of, we, we aren't as effective in reflecting the glory of God as we should because we got empty hands. We don't, we don't have confidence in the power of God flowing through us to lay hands on people and watch something happen. I so want us to live with people of power, anointed, flowing through. This only comes from the Holy Spirit. This is nothing that is within ourselves. It's not just summing it up. It's not just trying harder. It's not praying louder. It's not praying with emphasis. Or it, you know, it, is, you know, it is simply uh, my, my heart belongs to God, and He is now flowing through me. The, the reason we do, I think we lack in power is because we're living for our own glory. We want things the way we want it, and God says, I'm not going to share my glory with anyone. If you're living for your glory, I'll let you, but don't expect my glory to be reflected through you. You live for my glory. I'm looking. In fact, Scripture says God's looking. He's, he's looking right now. He's looking at your heart. You ready for it? You ready for more? You ready to reflect my glory? And whenever he sees a mirror lined up just right, he just releases his light. I just want his power released in our lives. I just want us lining up, church. Just imagine if the power of the Holy Spirit was alive in us and the sick were being healed, the blind were able to see, the lame were able to walk, the addicts were freed from bondage. Imagine, oh my goodness, we'd have to go to 87 services. And we'd do it, whatever it takes. So I want you to pray with me now. Pray with me now. Uh, I'm just going to ask Mark, just, just to lead us. Can, can we just pray as a church? Just take a moment. Where is God on you right now in these four realities of His glory? Where is God pointing the finger and saying, all right, I want you to be clay in my hands, and here is how I want you to reflect my glory. Here is the animal. Here is the creature that I want you to become. Is it the ox? God may be saying, I want you to live as a servant. It's not, about, it's not about your pleasure. It's not about your comfort. It's not about your preferences. It's not about your priorities. It is about others. Because Jesus, although he was the child of God, equal to God, he didn't consider himself equal to God. He considered himself a servant and humbled himself even to the cross. And Jesus said, to really reflect my glory, this is what it takes. So some of you, God is saying... I want you to live as a servant. That's where my hand is. And some, it's the face of the man. God says, your heart is a hard heart. It's a heart of stone. And I can't really reflect my glory. I need a mirror. I can't reflect my glory through a stone. He says, just like me, I want you to look out over people with compassion, with gentleness, with kindness. So God may be saying, today I want to I wanna soften your heart. Or maybe the eagle, and God says, today it's time for a coach to say, all right, let's shape up. You've been living the lazy, sluggard way, and I can't reflect my glory in that. I want you to live above reproach. I want people to look at you like they look at the flight of an eagle and say, wow. It's just something different about that person. To be a person of discipline, a 
person of focus, a person of ex excellence and integrity. God may be placing His hand on that in you right now. And I want you to just respond. Or finally, it may be the lion. And this is probably for all of us where we so desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit, His life breathing into our lives. And God just says, let me. Ask me of this. This is one of those things that's so cool. We, we, try, we try to convince God to give us His Holy Spirit. And God says, you know, it's just like a kid asking, asking a good parent for food. You just ask me and I'll, I'll give it. But we just got to humble ourselves like that child and say, God, it's not for my glory. Daddy, I want more of your life. Daddy, I want to I want to reflect you. I want to live for you. I want to love you. Daddy, will you breathe your life into us? Papa God, Abba Father, Daddy, will you, will you release your Holy Spirit to us today? Will you give us the power we need to live this life the way you want us to? We're kind of tired of doing it on our own kind of tired of trying to figure it out ourselves and do it by our own strength. And your word says it's not by might, it's by your spirit. So Father God, I ask you for your spirit today. I trust your word that says when we ask, you'll freely give. So Daddy, we, we need your Holy Spirit. If you fill us with power this morning. Forgive us for trying to do it ourselves, for focusing on our doing. God, today we change our mind, we change our direction. We say, God, have our heart, have our being, and fill us with your Holy Spirit and your power. Can we just spend a moment worshiping him? Offer up your prayers to God now. Either quietly to yourself, you can whisper now, whatever you, whatever you like. Let's just, wherever God's hand is on your heart now, would you just lift it to God? Let's worship. Pray to Him. Seek His face for a moment. Just one look at your face. Just one glance into your eyes. Yes. We want to look like you. We want to reflect your glory. My whole world has changed. Oh Lord, we want to see your face. Yes. Yes. The beauty of your holiness. Oh God. Take us in. Revelation, those four creatures were saying holy. Let's sing that together, church. Come on, church, let's sing. Let's just, let's live as those four creatures and just proclaim the holiness of God. One word to describe. Oh, 
day when you start your day you just pray God make me like the ox today let me serve make me like the man today give me a heart of compassion make me like the eagle today I want to be excellent I want to serve you with excellence and treat others with excellence and make me like the lion today fill me with your power if we will seek these things to reflect the glory of God in this way I believe oh my goodness it would change our world before I end, I've told you every week, if you'll do what I can't do, I'll do what you may not be comfortable doing. I, I can't know all the people you know, so if you will invite your friends every week, I'll be faithful to give them an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Some of you are awesome with this. Some of you are like the, the friends in the Bible when Jesus was at a house. They were desperate to get their friend into his presence, so they broke the joker's roof tore a hole in his roof and lowered him down to be at Jesus. Please don't do that. We've got doors, as you see. You don't have to do that. But I, I just want you to live with that, that compassion and heart for whatever it takes to get the people in your life in God's presence. And if you do that every week, I'm going to be faithful to give an invitation to ask people to respond. So if you're here today, if you're a guest, or maybe you've been with us for a while, and just today it's like looking at an eagle, just, whoa, I'm seeing something that I need and I want. And you want to live for God's glory. I invite you now to respond to Jesus. Just say yes to Jesus. There's all these things, all, all the things we've been talking about, this is the process of going from glory to glory. This isn't about salvation. Salvation is all on Jesus. We don't work it. We don't earn it. We don't strive for it. Salvation is simply receiving the gift that God is holding out to you right now and saying thank you. It is not by works so none of us can boast. Jesus says, I offer this to you freely. It costs it cost us everything, but it costs you nothing. I give it to you freely because you can't earn it yourself. And so the gift of eternal life can begin right now. And it starts by acknowledging that Jesus is Lord and that He is the one that paid the price for your sins. It is acknowledging that you fall way short of His glory. And we all have. And then it is by faith in Jesus, take over my life. I don't want to live for myself. I live for your glory now. So church, let's pray this. And if you're saying yes to Jesus now, would you lift this prayer up by faith? Everybody just pray it out with me. Say, dear Jesus... I believe in you, and I've fallen short of your glory. Thank you for dying for me, for paying the price of my sin. Forgive me, wash me clean, and take over my life. Teach me to reflect your glory from this day on. In Jesus' name. Amen.